episode 86. So I'm going to toss for raising the food IQ of American families and um, to a mission that um, I've been undertaking, which is trying to put American families back in the kitchen. It seems like a small thing, but um, it would be a great thing. So to the food IQ of American families. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Just Forking Around podcast, a show about the wonderful world of food and beverages and the incredible people who grow, craft, brew, cook, serve, and create within it. I am your host, Debbie Salzberg, and every week I speak with everyone from the farmers to franchisers, as well as restaurateurs, chefs, winemakers, brewers, and really anyone else who plays a pivotal part in keeping the food and beverage industry beautiful, amazing, more than a little crazy, and always unique. And this week, we raise our glass and we toast with Chef Gino Campagna. Now, for more than 15 years, Chef Gino Campagna has made it his personal mission to raise kids' food IQs and help fight childhood obesity. And his philosophy is that if kids are involved in their food choices and preparations, they will be more motivated to try new nutritious foods. So he's been on shows like Kitchen Kids, uh, Gino's Kitchen on the Disney Channel. He served on Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution team. Oh, and he's been just recently on A&E's Emmy Award winning show, Born This Way. Chef Gino teaches kids in LA and Italy, and you can visit him online at chefgino.club. Uh, he has a cookbook out, which we chat about in this episode. It's called Taste Test Challenge, released in 2017. I definitely recommend checking that out. I love that cookbook. And this is a really cool collaboration and passion of Gino, of Chef Gino's. That's a little bit more recent. When we recorded this episode, he had just returned from an event, a huge event uh, in Italy, and it's called rural.it, R-U-R-A-L dot I-T. So first off, this it's nothing less than spectacular, this event. The farmers and the ranchers of Emilia Romana, Liguria, and Tuscany, see, they're committed to recover and protect ancient plant and animal varieties that have been abandoned for decades and are near extinction. So I'll give you an example. There's this tomato, right? Emilio Romana has a very delicate skin. It's ancient, you know, heirloom tomato, but it costs so much to grow because it takes um, a lot of effort. And then to sell this, it takes even more money to set that up if the conditions, you can imagine with the weather conditions, to grow that tomato if all of a sudden you can lose it so easily. So it's about to go extinct. So what if an event such as rural.it is what this does, could support that farmer to grow what would have been a year's worth of product, right? So it takes a year's worth of product to help support them grow this. And then what happens is at this three-day event, they've created sauces and pastes and other products out of those tomatoes and they sell it out usually, and they make that money in a three-day event that may have taken a year or two years to have made, and that is if the weather conditions were perfecto, of course, for that tomato. So follow me on this. So basically, they're helping the farmers and the ranchers, right, to maintain the integrity of these ancient varieties. But what they're also doing is create is preventing biodiversity loss. So first, we should define biodiversity. So biodiversity boosts ecosystems' productivity, productivity, where each species, no matter how small, have an important role to play. So a larger number of plant species means a greater variety of crops. Greater species diversity ensures natural sustainability for all life forms. So really, our decisions as human beings govern the future of this earth. I mean, that's... It's huge. It kind of blows my mind when we think about what goes on in farming and pesticides, 
like Roundup, for example, and other things that happen to our environments, destruction. But there's something so interesting about these delicate ecosystems. They are something that we have that are called keystone species. So every ecosystem all around the world has a keystone species. And if you remove off, completely wipe out that keystone species, you literally will collapse the entire ecosystem. So you probably all know about the coral reefs. We talk a lot about that worldwide, but in um, the New Zealand, Australia area, the Great, the Great Barrier Reef, of course, is a big one. What happens when we destroy that? But let's talk about other things. Like what about sea otters? Sea otters are a keystone species. And what happens is these mammals, right, they feed on sea urchins. And so they basically control the sea urchins population. But if the otters didn't eat these sea urchins, the urchins would eat up the habitat's kelp. And as we know, kelp feeds the entire ecosystem of that area. So the sea otters are not replaceable. Thus, they're called a keystone species. Uh, another one would be jaguars. Jaguars, they're you know a predator, but they're also a keystone species because they play a crucial role in their ecosystem because without jaguars, herbivorous prey animals would decimate the plants of their ecosystem. So jaguars help keep a balance in the food chain, even though they are at the top. So getting back to that tomato, if you're trying to connect the dots on that, you're going to have to listen to this episode because we do talk about this Emilio Romana tomato and the effects of how from growing to selling at rural.it it affects so much more than just a delicious tomato in your belly. <laughs> so without further ado, everybody, please enjoy this episode with Chef Gino Capagna. Okay, so Chef Gino Campagna, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I love it. And, um, you know, we're going to get into, I mean, I literally could sit here for the next like five minutes and list all the accolades you've received over the past 15 years or so. So we're going we're gonna to try to narrow it down to the, your cookbook, your TV series, and your most recent Italy trip uh, where you are at a huge festival food festival about biodiversity. So we'll get into all that. But first, Chef, we have to start this off with a toast. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I should have the toast ready, right? And tell you what it's for, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to raise... I just have a, I have a coffee and a water that I'm, I'm going to chin chin with. <laughs> <laughs> so I raise my well, glass. <laughs> great. And I do have a hot tea because I'm a little bit... I'm, I just came back from Italy, as you said, and I'm a little bit under the weather. So I'm going to toss for raising the food IQ of American families and um, to a mission that um, I've been undertaking, which is trying to put American families back in the kitchen. It seems like a small thing, but um, it would be a great thing. So to the food IQ of American families. Ah, cheers. I love it. I'm going to take a sip. Cheers. Chin chin. Mm, mm. Chin chin. <laughs> okay. So Chef Gino. You know, when I think about your background, you know, you grew up in, in Parma and I think, I, I want to know what it was like at the Campania dinner table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's what your mom is, Pina, your dad, Ettore, uh, maybe Grandma Otto was there. Can you paint us the picture a little bit? Well, you did your homework. That's exactly the name of my family members. And, um, and when I say, you know, I just want to um, uh, specify, I come from Parma, which I always say is the capital of food in the universe. Everything good comes from Parma. Parmigiano Reggiano, Parma Ham. In Parma, we have the largest food convention in um, in Europe every two years called Chibus. Barilla pastas from Parma, and also Parma is the capital of food in the European market. So believe me when I say Parma is the capital of food in the universe. And um, uh, speaking of my um, household, when I was um, and was little. Well, I, I li grew up in a very poor neighborhood, in um, historically poor neighborhood in Parma. And I was uh, born in this house facing this little square. And I always say to everybody who, who wants to listen to my story that I maybe was poor in terms of money. We were not poor in terms of value. There was an incredible sense of community around the square. Everybody knew each other. We kids were in the street all the time playing. 
never get into trouble because everybody was keeping an eye on <laughs> us. But also the luxury I really had was that um, uh, around this square, we had the pastry store, uh, the baker, the grocery store, the milk lady, the vegetable stand. So I didn't have to go anywhere else to be exposed to the greatest ingredient in the world. You know, money cannot buy the kind of ingredients I grew up with. And it was great. You know, as a kid, I would go shop for my mom or I would help her cook because everything in Italy at the time, it's a little change now, but at the time, everything revolved around the kitchen table. You know, usually your mom would cook and you would help and she'll need something. For example, the funny story I say all the time, my mom would send me to buy the cheese. She didn't have to say Parmigiano Reggiano. <laughs> it's just simply called, it's just simply called <laughs> the, the cheese. cheese in Parma because it's the oxygen of every recipe that they, they do in, in, in Italy, you know. So my mom not only was a home cook, but she was also a cook at the local nursery school. And that was a nursery school I attended, attending as a kid. And then I started teaching there when I got my teaching degree. Because I, I like to remind everybody, yes, I call myself Chef Gino. But because I work with kids, I want to just make sure that everybody understands that I consider myself an educator. My background is in education. I have an easy way to communicate with children. And I use that to teach cooking. And to go back to, to go back what was life in, uh, in my household, yeah. My mother would make um, all the food that we would eat. Sometimes my grandmother would help. I would say the best thing that she does is Parma Classics pasta, which are ravioli. We call them tortelli and, and capelletti. And there's two different, they're basically different. One is um, uh, a stuffed pasta with usually uh, ricotta cheese and um, spinach or squash and amaretto cookies. And then it's uh, boiled and dressed with the Parmigiano Reggiano and butter. Capelletti are dumplings, so similar in the construction, a little smaller. They meet, fill, and you drink them with broth. So both ravioli, which we call tortelli, and capelletti definitely were a staple in my family. And definitely that was the, the thing that my mom would do best. Oh, I bet. And I bet the, the smell, the scent, like the when you would walk in, I know there, you refer a little bit in your cookbook um, to your dad on Sundays with the, with the broth. You cook. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was his, his, he loved my, that. My father was macho, but wasn't macho, but he either, but he insisted every Sunday for broth. Even if we go to a picnic, my mom would have to prepare broth. And, you know, it's not uncommon in both restaurants and houses in Parma to uh, walk into kitchen and see a gigantic pot filled with chickens and meats and vegetables boiling to make the broth for the capelletti. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Parma, they also eat the vegetable and meat used for the preparation of the broth. They don't throw away anything. Um, a main course in Parma would be called bolliti, the boiled meats. And those are the meats that you boil for the soup, and they will be accompanied with gray sauce, you know, like a green sauce, a red sauce, and sometimes uh, like pickled fruits. And so that's that that's um, a tradi traditional food from Italy. My mom would do that too. Wow, it must have been, I just picture this just amazing time growing up and it must be interesting to kind of translate that now to your family here in LA, you know, <laughs> like that, that, that influence that you had. I'm sure that you try to, you know, probably obviously sit down and have meals with your family to kind of remind you know, everybody of family time and dinner and complete those um, feelings that you had. Is that, is it, it must be a little more difficult in LA to translate that? Or is it when you sit down with the food coming together over community, it doesn't matter where you are? Well, you know, I made a point, been married for 24 years. We have 23 years twins. Uh, my son is now a chef in London. My daughter lives with her boyfriend here in Los Angeles. But as long as we live together, and even now with my wife, I made a point of uh, cooking and eating together if we are in the house, you know. And um, it paid off, you know. Um, people, people, we are the favorite household from our friends to come and visit <laughs> I us, bet. you know, because, <laughs> because we make sure that we sit around and uh, no electronics, and we talk about things, and I always, you know, there's never plastic plates, you know. We sit down with silver and real plates, and I'll try to make a balanced meal. But I, I don't just cook one thing. So even everyday cooking, even everyday cooking in the house has always been um, 
by American standard, uh, extravagant, let's put it like that. <laughs> I, I remember plenty of my uh, kids' friends wanting to come and have lunch and dinner with us, you know, because we, and to these days, my kids were very popular at college because whenever they were gathering together with their friends in somebody's house and they needed to feed them themselves, they would look at my kids because they knew how to open a refrigerator or a pantry and cook something, you know. It's something that they learn by just watching me, helping me. In fact, my son now is a better chef than I am. Uh-huh. He works in a chef in restaurant in a restaurant in London, and uh, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, that's amazing. So, speaking of when I when I, I first of all, I love this book. Your um, the taste test challenge, Chef Gino's taste. It's amazing, and there's something extremely approachable about it. And I just smile when I when I go through it and I read it, and it's 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 awesome. This must this is a labor of love. I wish I'm sure because. You must have spent a lot of time putting this together. It's, it's, it, you know, it tells a little bit about your, tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind it. Cause it sort of, I think, translates what we were just talking about with your, you know, your kids know how to open up a refrigerator and, and, and what to do with that. <laughs> Absolutely right. I mean, I didn't want to do another cookbook where the recipe were, you know, the peanut butter sandwich or the ants on a log or, you know, the classic kids recipe. These recipe in these books are really, not necessarily kids' recipe, you know what I mean? We're talking about fresh pasta made from scratch and, and ravioli, or we're talking about crepes, and we're talking about so uh, we're talking about ribolita soup. So these are these are somewhat sophisticated recipes that anybody can do and anybody will enjoy. The attitude, the purpose of the book is pretty much in line with my philosophy. I didn't want the cookbook to be intimidating. I think sometimes people pick up a cookbook, don't have an ingredient, move on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one until they run out of option and go out and eat something at Pizza Hut. You know, you're, you're uh, right about that because this, this, exactly, this book is so approachable and it's not just for kids. I mean, I, I love this book. I, it's when you open it, um, we'll go through a little bit, some of it, but I, I do, um, won't reveal everything because, you know, you have to leave that uh, surprise <laughs> for, <laughs> for the person individually. But the way that, the pictures are, and it's so approachable that I feel even if I don't know how to navigate necessarily through a kitchen, I can, I feel comfortable following along here. I like, I like recipes that are like canvas. You know, people always come to me and say, Chef, you know, what is the recipe for marinara sauce, for example? And I always said, well, there's no, first thing, there, first thing, there's no such thing as marinara sauce in, in Italy. It's called <laughs> tomato sauce, salsa al pomodoro. And then I say, well, yeah, well, for example, uh, ragu alla bolognese, right? The, the, the famous bolognese sauce that um, they have in Bologna. Yes, that one, there's a trademark recipe somewhere in a safe, in a monastery somewhere in Bologna, okay? <laughs> but, but generically speaking, even that recipe, my mom would do it her way. You know what I mean? Like she would not be slave to the recipe. I mean, if you don't like something, you're allowed to change. I mean, <laughs> right. uh, once you are, once you understand the spirit of the recipe, and that was my point with the, with my book, I tackle uh, recipes as I said that they're like canvas, uh, pizza or salads or soups or crepes, things that once you understand the essence of them, you can improvise upon. I tell kids in the book, you know, you can change uh, ingredients um, if you don't like it. If you want a spicier, you can make it spicier. If you don't like something, you can change it. And I say, no, you can just simply change everything for chocolate, though. You know, otherwise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but a little common sense um, and a little understanding of what you like. I mean, people have to take back the uh, empowerment that cooking is. You make your food, your your own critic. If somebody tells you this is the greatest food you've ever ate, but you don't like it, you, there's nothing wrong with you. You just don't like it. It's a personal thing, you know? So I just didn't want another book where you, you either do it like me or you're going to have something terrible. And so my, I'm, I'm happy you like the book. I just want it to be friendly, to look at, not intimidating. I, um, I always know that to see a big guy smiling through the pages is inviting. You know what I mean? You don't have... Um, you don't have some sort of a celebrity chef and um, um, uh, that has a restaurant somewhere in Las Vegas to tell you to cook. <laughs> I always, I all my philosophy is always home cooking. You know, my my mom wasn't a chef. My mom was a home cook. Proud of it. Proud of it. I always tell people, you know, in 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 Italy, 
any Italian walks in any restaurant in the world knowing that their mom is a better cook than the one in the kitchen. You know what I mean? And they can be critical. And I want people to understand, I think there's a little bit of disservice that came with the celebrity chef um, cycle. Is that intimidates people. It takes them away, I believe, from the preparation of food. They say, oh my God, I can't do that. Those are professional. They study for years. I'll, I'll never be able to do it. And I think that's a little bit of a disservice, you know? And um, I, I think, and we'll talk about it later, I think we're coming a little bit to the end of a circle with this celebrity chef. And I think there's another big cycle that's going to open soon. And that's about ingredients and the people who can tell the story of ingredients. I think that's a new cycle. That's a new cycle. And because I think it's becoming too stylized, this idea of the celebrity chef. And, and, and they're all great people. I mean, I work with Jamie Oliver. Jamie's a fantastic guy. And he tried to do so much for improving kids' um, food here in Los Angeles. But I'm saying, generically speaking, a chef is a chef. Stay in the kitchen, cook, you know, <laughs> and let us, <laughs> right. let us go on with our life. You know, we need to feed ourselves. But in order to feed ourselves, we need to know what we're using. That's what I'm saying. I think, I think ingredients are going to be more important than Celebrity Chef coming up. Uh, I think that's true. I agree with that. And the, you know, the other part I love about this book is in your cookbook is like you have little facts, like for example, and your, the names of the dishes you, you make fun. So like yes, uh, yes. <laughs> thumbprints, a.k.a. gnocchi. And the word gnocchi, it's hard to pronounce, you know, because of the G-N, it's silent. And it's, um, it, you know, it's like how to, how to pronounce it. Um, and also thumbprints, why Why did you name it Thumbprints? I think, isn't there a, a reason for your... There's a specific reason. I mean, I think I think you asked me about my mom. I think the first memory I have of helping my mom, it's of her making gnocchi. And the way you make gnocchi, you you boil potatoes, you, uh, you mash them, and then add some flour. Some people put eggs, some people don't. Some people put uh, salt, some people don't. But then you make a sort of a snake, a little dumpling. Now, if you want the dumpling to receive more sauce, you know, you have to make some sort of an indent in the, in the gnocchi, in the dumpling. And so the dumplings are pretty small. And as a kid, I had a pretty small thumb. So my job was to put a little indent in every gnocchi that my mom would do. And so that's why I called them um, like that in, in, in my book, because it reminded me of my first job helping my mom in the kitchen. I love that. And then there's another, um, the squashetti. Squashetti. Well, it's like a, a. It was funny because you, if you're Italian, you're like, please, please don't read this paragraph because <laughs> it may sound like madness. It. But it's. <laughs> I hate to say. I mean, uh, I um. Uh, and again, um, I just came back from Italy. I don't want to. I don't want to alarm anybody. I was eating. I was eating pasta. I was eating bread. In Italy, I was reading sweets. I mean, I'm there for two weeks. Everybody wants to take me out, so I indulge a little bit. Yet, I never felt sick loaded i felt energetic and i hate to say when i'm in america if i try to eat the same way especially with with um, carbs i feel bloated i don't feel good i put on weight and i think there's something we've been messing with our food a little too much and there's not enough regulation in this country and so i know for myself that if i stay away from pasta and bread which is really hard because i'm italian i feel better so i found this wonderful uh, spaghetti squash and uh, and uh, I just love it because it, it gives you somewhat the satisfaction of looking at your plate like let's just say I do a bolognese sauce and it does look like a gigantic plate of bolognese sauce <laughs> but you're eating squash you know with very little calories and so forth but Italians Italians trust me they will take away my passport if they read that <laughs> recipe. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to block that part up for our Italian, li- <laughs> our Italy listeners, because that does we do have listeners in Italy. So the uh, <laughs> so the beginning in the prelude here, when you say "dear parents," and you have a few pages of um, you noting a little bit of your history, there's some part of this book you says, but this book also reflects another passion of mine: working with children. Sure. So, because you really know how to walk into a room with kids in a classroom and just get them going and get them engaged and have as many, you know, five kids or, you know, a huge room of kids all under, you know, Chef Gino's, you know, <laughs> cooking guy spell. They all are so into you. So what, what, tell us a little bit about what it is that you're, how you approach this and what your, um, I know that your goal is to raise the IQ and I think you're starting right. with kids and that will 
translate into adults as well. Well, this goes back to why I consider myself an educator. I mean, everybody has talent, you know, and I realized early in my life that my talent was to communicate enthusiasm and fun to children easily. I always wanted to be a teacher. I mean, I ended up not being specifically a teacher, but working with kids all my life. So I, I fulfill a, a childhood dream. I was the kid in in that was 10 years old, and my mom would send me to somebody else's house where a nine, to help a nine years old do his homework for a little tip that I would bring back to my mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was always yeah. I was always that guy. And when I start uh, studying uh, to become a teacher. And we would go in schools to practice. Um, I could tell kids reacted to me differently. And um, I started working immediately after my teaching degree. And instead of working specifically in one school, I was going around different schools. I work a lot in early education. Early education is really a, an avant-garde art in my area. Everybody in, in, U, in the USA knows the Reggio Emilia method is considered by Newsweek Every year, the best nursery school in the world. Parma is not dissimilar. We have we had incredible programs there. But I would go, um, I would go school to school to help teacher with their curriculum. Now, my method, which also brings us back a little bit to what you were mentioning earlier about the little facts in my uh, book. My method is not a laboratory method. Um, it's not a method where you set up a goal and step by step you get there. My method has more to do with fun games, enthusiasm, you know, and, and a little bit of theater and a little bit of storytelling. So I was always able to, uh, if I had a goal, if I would talk to a teacher and say, well, Gino, look, this group hasn't really bonded uh, as we wanted to, and it's already October, what can we do? And then I would create a program usually involving a story where all the kids would have to do something together. And at the end of that program, they would... Um, achieve the goal that we set up for ourselves. That's why in my book, I put those stories. I think children love stories. And I think to know where food comes from, a little trivia, little fun fact to stay with you forever. Once you have a familiarity with the product, with an ingredient, with a recipe, because you know the story, it's easier to remember, easy to be more adventurous. What I'm saying is, Knowledge is everything, you know. Too many times, I think, in America, we consider our, our kids, when it comes to food, second-class citizens, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Really bizarre. it's really bizarre to me. The richest country in the world, but when it comes to our children, we just want them to eat grilled cheese sandwich, pizza, you know, mac and cheese until they're 18, and then hopefully they'll make educated choices after that. Remember, our palates, our taste buds, um, educate themselves from an early age. So if we don't start early, it may be hard to catch up, you know. And as I said, you can only, you can't force anybody to do it. You're going to have to make, otherwise it becomes like a chore. You can't wait to get out. But if you make understanding food, trying food, um, be adventurous, uh, something fun, and that's what I'm good at, but then, but then mission accomplished. Yeah, I love that. And so when you, after you, have completed this book and you're sat down, you're looking at it. What, what parts are you most proud of from the book? Well, you know, I tell you what I was most proud was uh, actually uh, in February, I went back to Parma. I presented the book. I did a book signing in the largest bookstore in, in Parma. And I brought my mom and she invited all the old ladies from the neighborhood. It was a packed house. I read the introduction, I translated it, which was about, you know, the neighborhood and, and the story I, I told you earlier. And I expanded a little, you know, I entertained people with longer stories and more stories. First of all, my mom was over the moon. At the end of it, she was signing the book for me. You know, she was <laughs> so, so happy about That's it. That's amazing. But secondly, I must have hit a chord because so many people came to me and said, this was wonderful. It was so great. I think there's, People are longing for, for experiences like the one I described. I mean, we cannot always go forward and forward without looking backward. Um, we, we can have the most technological tools at our disposal. I think people long for human touch. I think people long for real bonding, physically talking, playing together if you're a child, eating together. I mean, we could have an app where we can sit at the table with everybody around the world, Okay. But I don't. I do think there's there's something to the. I know I sounds like I'm a hundred years old, 
but I've decided to stand by my belief. And, and, and when I did that presentation, I was really proud of it. I was proud for my mom. And I was sort of a happy that people seems to relate to what I, you know, my, my philosophy in terms of um, social interaction and how, and how much, how important food is, at least, you know, in Italy, uh, in the social interaction. I mean, uh, yeah, it's everything. Everywhere. It's everything too. I everything. love. Yeah, I'm. I stand with you on the br- coming together o- over food. I feel like you, you can't substitute that over like a Skype video call no. or an app. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> you cannot. Can. You cannot. What would your dad say to you, as, or what does he say to you as he's looking down about about okay, little Gino? You're gonna make me. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> now you're gonna make me cry. Oh. My father would be very proud. I, I know he would be very proud. He didn't live long enough. He died very young. I was 20 years old when my father died. He was 50. He didn't live long enough to see myself. And my, my, my brother is a designer and director. He came to America with me and he was very successful. He, he won an Emmy. He won all sorts of, of, of awards. But he, would be, he was fascinated, I know, with American culture. And particularly the fact that I came to America, I married an actress, you know, mm-hmm. and he loved movies. And uh, I, uh, I was somewhat successful in America. I was on TV and there was a book. I think it would make him proud, not just because he could see that I, I do something that I love to do, but that I did it in America. Because I think he'd never been to America, but growing up, he would watch American movie, read, you know, translation of American books. And I know he was fascinated by that culture. We are going to pause this episode just for a moment so I can tell you a few things. First of all, my social media handles. The first one is Instagram. I love Instagram. My handle is at Forking Podcast. That's F O R K I N G Podcast. On Facebook, it is Debbie.Salzburg. And I have some videos up there from uh, past episodes. I just interviewed Dr. Tio Maceo. She's the author of the Madame of Love Coco book. Excellent video. And most importantly, I want to announce a t-shirt giveaway winner. So I pulled the name last week and I contacted him. His name is Jay Kelly from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I sent him out a JFA t-shirt. And you're probably wondering, how did he get one? Well, as you know, from the Forkisode episode series, there's a silverware challenge in there. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, uh, definitely after you listen to this episode, go back to episode 84 or 81 or this Friday's 87. And these Forkisodes are bonus episodes, story style tell of my restaurant pick of the week at a Los Angeles restaurant. And you too can win a t-shirt if you email in your guesses as to how many times you heard silverware fall to the ground during that episode. Yes, silverware ninja style. So without further ado, let's get back to the episode with Chef Gino. Chef Gino, there is the celebrity side of you. I mean, you have done, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have web web series you've done, also TV series. Uh, Born This Way was the most more recent one. You want to tell us a little bit about your experience on Born This Way? There was actually two episodes, I think season one and season four. I also work on season season one, season two. I think I took a break on season three and then season, season four. four. Right. And there was, I mean, that's just so, that that's the spectacular, those, those um, I'll oh, have links yeah. to your, I'll have yeah. links for it on the, on the show you. notes. Yeah, amazing. So tell us a little bit about that. That's spectacular. You, you're absolutely right. I've done television. I, um, I started with a bang. In fact, I had a show on Disney channels before anybody was talking about the issue of food and, and children. I, I was lucky enough to pitch an idea for a show and be on TV for a year on, on Disney channel. Then I work on TV in Italy in top rated cooking show. And then I started doing a lot of local television. I'm a brand ambassador. I, um, I also did like a little bit of reality show, uh, like I was on basketball wives and, and so forth. But nothing, nothing I've ever done. Um, and I, 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 um, I consider myself lucky. I work in an environment where I give love and I receive love. And that's a luxury. And that's something that um, I, I know it's a luxury and I enjoy. I work with children and you give and receive love all the time. I don't wake up and say, oh, I got to go to the office. What a bummer. So I'm, I'm lucky in that sense. But nothing um, 
And, and I work with special needs, and I hate the terms. I work with special needs. I do a lot of special needs classes. I work with special needs when I was an educator. So I, 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 it, it, was, it was not a surprise. But when they called me for this show, and which is a show of A&E, the fourth season just finished, it's called Born This Way. It's a reality show that chronicles the life of seven young adults with Down syndrome and their quest for independence, love. Uh, relationship and so forth. When they called me, I was a little aware. I was saying, wait a second, I don't want to participate in something that exploits the life of, um, of people with Down syndrome. Then I realized it was really good nature and actually it became a revolutionary show on television because the community of uh, Down syndrome uh, families and special needs kids embraced this show so much. These kids became stars you know if they go to las vegas mariah carey's on stage it bring them on stage yeah. it won an emmy there was a <laughs> glorious picture of the cast on the emmy stage with the emmy it, it just gave hope to so many families that if there's there's a way to have to to overcome uh, the issue of down syndrome and and find yourself with a career with relationship just give hope to so many people so it turned out that it was a wonderful a wonderful show and um I still remember the first season they called me and I said, Chef Gino, we'll, we'll just want you to teach them how to make pasta, which is my mm -hmm. classic. So we went and we had the best time. Oh my God, the just egg, got cracking to know the this eggs. Guy, <laughs> cracking <laughs> eggs in the head. You know, they were laughing. In fact, in fact, to tell the truth, a little secret. The producer sent me out. He said, Gino, they're having too much fun. We need to create a little drama. It's a reality <laughs> show, you know? And so they created artificially a little drama that wasn't even there just because it's, they thought, it is, it's, just, it's a reality show. We need to, and, and to their credit, when they create a little drama in the show, they also resolve it pretty quickly. So yeah, it's very no, benign, yeah. it's very yeah. sweet. <laughs> uh, we had a best time. And then the second season come up and it's, you know, you know, television um, timing, maybe eight, nine months later, they call me and say, look, uh, Chef Gino, they want to, the kids want to uh, do a dinner for their parents. The parents do so much for them. They want to, uh, come up with the recipes, prep, cook, and serve the dinner like it's a restaurant. It's a great idea. And so, so, so I said, go and meet them and talk about the recipe and, and we'll film it. And I'm thinking, they're not even going to remember me. You know, it's almost a year ago. They've been, yeah. they've been doing the show. They've been around the world. And we were shooting this at this beautiful place um, here in Los Angeles called Leaps and Bounds, which is a gym for special need kids who also has the kitchen. That's where we shoot. Where, that's where they shoot the reality show. And that's where I shoot my uh, kitchen segment and there's this beautiful if you if you caught it and maybe I, I put it on my uh youtube channel if you catch the entrance i walk into the oh, room yeah. I nine months later room. and they see me and they <laughs> run to me chef gino chef gino and they hug me and it, I, I swear to god i always said maybe my proudest moment in uh, in my career I, I it is i'll put a link on that too it's i saw that i didn't know that that was an actual because, you know, it is re reality TV. I didn't know right. that was an actual, like, that actually happened. It felt like it did. Because it was, I just sm started it did, smiling. It did happen. Yeah. There's, there's, no, there's no fake in there. So <laughs> then then they came up with this eclectic uh, menu. And we go, and we proceed to cook it. And then they serve it to their parents. And I still remember them running back into the kitchen. We did it, Chef Gino. We did it. We oh did it. I was wonderful. That is amazing. And then the second, and then the other um, episode has to do with, uh, I think you were cooking something from from the cookbook, which means pretty much they had full reign of however they wanted to create that that dish, which uh, I don't know if I should yeah, reveal the, it. We, we, we ended, up, ended up showing pancakes in yeah. the last episode, yeah. and, they went cra and they went crazy with pancakes. We had, uh, we had shot much longer. We, we stayed in the studio all day, and I had them cook actually frittata, because I know pancakes is fun and colorful, but you know, it's, it's still... I would rather have a savory and a little bit um, more interesting recipe. So we ended up, they ended up just showing the, just showing the, the pancakes. But again, what you see there, the happiness is all true. There's no faking that. Yeah, you know, there's you no taking yeah. these guys and say, you can, you just simply, you can with kids, generically speaking. But um, it was my proudest job. And um, I'm very proud of those guys, and yeah. and I and I love them. Yeah, bravo! That's amazing. So then I and then I know that 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 was a we were going to meet up a few months ago. And then that was happening, and then we were going to meet up again to record this. And then then you went to Italy. Um, yeah, this is your new 
new passion, which I really want to talk oh, yeah. about. Yeah, it's exciting. It's about biodiversity. You're at the Rural Festival. Tell us a, a little bit, aside from breaking you know, a world record there. <laughs> uh, 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 we'll talk about it, uh, about the road record. So uh, when I was in Italy in February to present my book in the local bookstore, I had a series of meetings. Everybody always wants to meet me, Chef Gino here, there. But, you know, it, it, Italians are, are interested in what I do, but then I work in America. But at the end of my thing, I met this incredible individual, uh, which is the patron and the guy who started this fantastic project called Rural. He pretty much bought a valley. I call him the Jurassic Park man because <laughs> I felt like I was in that Jeep with Jeff Goldberg, you know, looking at dinosaurs. <laughs> he bought a, a valley and in this valley, it's a park dedicated to biodiversity. So what did he do? He pretty much, uh, his, his philosophy is, if, uh, and I'll make an example with one ingredient. Parma used to grow, they still grow put, uh, tomatoes. There's a large, large uh, economy based on tomato. When I was a kid, for example, I would pick tomatoes in the, in the field to make money so that I can pay for my vaca vacation. It's a classic student job during the summer. So tomato everywhere. But Parma's tomato was a tomato called Pomodoro Riccio. And it's, it, it would look more like what you call a heirloom tomato, right? It's not that round, perfect tomato, but, you know, it has sort of a crest, right? Now, Parma, the rich tomato was a, a local tomato that was the, the, the result of thousands of years of adapting to the soil, to the weather. And it was a fantastically flavorful tomato. And it was very digestible. Turn out that um, the part that you digest less in tomato is the skin. And this particular tomato had a very thin skin, almost translucent. Mm. That's why not only was delicious and full nutrition, but it was also very digestible. But what happened is in recent years, it wasn't convenient to grow it anymore. And the reason is machine cannot pick it up. You cannot stack it. This skin that is so thin and makes it desirable as a tomato was not industrially speaking, convenient. Oh, wow. And so they started growing Monsanto oh, seeds. No. Uh, oh, yes, shit. yes. Now they grow oh, tomato shit. that you cannot even pierce oh, yeah. with a fork, shit. with a fork. So what does this guy do? He, talk, he talks to the local farmer. He said, look, you're breaking your back for pennies on the pound yep. to, grow this, to grow this Monsanto tomato, oh, yeah. grow the rich tomato, make the best uh, tomato sauce you have, and then we'll sell it at a festival. And so he not only has dedicated a valley to show people and make people understand about biodiversity, but he organized, it's been the fifth edition this year, this gigantic festival where all the producers that believe in biodiversity in the area come with the produce they, they produce in one year. So the guy who grows this biodiversity uh, potato, the potato that they were almost extinct, he doesn't sell the potato, but he makes potato pies or potato something, and he prepares them. And then in two days of festival, he sells all of his inventory. Okay, that so, Gino is brilliant because you're it's giving brilliant. it's brilliant because the it's this it's double solution. You know, it's it's you're giving people the farmers the opportunity to not to not waste, right? So they're they're giving them a reason right. to stay in alignment with the or heirloom organic, you know, organically natured produce. Produce, yes, yeah. sorry, thank yeah. My yeah, God, no, those guys, amazing. those guys would be the guys at the side of the road trying to sell a piece of cheese to you so that they can pay the bill for that month, right? Yeah. Those guys had a hard life, not only growing and preparing the, the product, but selling it because it's a niche, it's a little more expensive. So you, you, you absolutely nailed it. How brilliant it is. They, last year, they did the festival in two places, one in Parma and one in Tuscany. They didn't do it this year. They just did it in Parma because by the time they get to Tuscany, they run out of produce. They really? sell everything. Oh my God. I'm going to so go next year. Guys, yeah, I'm definitely going to I'm going to go oh, next year. Oh, you have to come. I'm you definitely, to come. Go, I'm, definitely I'm, going. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually thinking about bringing bringing uh, them into Los Angeles. And obviously you'll be invited if I, when I'll do the event. Yeah. I want people to see, I mean, the point is not for people to say, great, I'm going to put this Pomodoro Riccio in, in Oakland, California. That's not the point. The point is understanding a philosophy. The point is understanding um, a new style of living. Uh, again, is, is to me, 
these guys in the middle of nowhere, Italy, who have a difficulties going on national news, they should be on the cover of New York Times because they're so cutting edge. They going forward but looking backward. And it's an amazing thing. This guy, I, I, I don't know if we have time to go into it, but this yeah, guy I mean, This is me, so interesting to me. We, can keep, we yeah. had, we, he's, he's telling me, there was a local cow in Parma, in these hills. A cow that's been here forever. They, they love the terrain, eat the food here, and so forth. And then it became more convenient to bring cows down from Poland or Northern Europe, wherever. So he said, I found, I found the last existing, the last existing cow of that particular breed, sick and almost dead in a farm in the middle of nowhere. I put it on my truck, brought it to the vet, get it back in shape. And I said, well, that's great. Now you save that cow. Once the cow dies, it's over. I said, no, Gino, I went to the local university where they keep fr frozen all the sperm from all the species and I inseminated there. And I, we have now successfully, we're going to re, um, how do you say, revamp this breed that was going to be extinct. I mean, this guy yeah. is a genius. No, that's He's amazing. a genius. Yeah. So, and, he, yeah. And, and people love him and people love him. He's, um, I've never seen anybody. There's, there's 150 people, 200 people working like crazy the day before when I get there. Not an argument, not a question. Mm. He would command, uh, not command, but show everybody what to do, and they would follow. He's, he's a true leader, and he's not a protagonist. You'll never see a picture of him. You'll never see an in, uh, interview. He's behind the scene. Is we he, share the same. Was he the one that was on? There's two. There's one. There's a somebody in a helicopter, kind of showing from an aerial view of rural, because it's rural.it. But then yes. there's also um, a gentleman that you have on your Instagram. I don't think no. I, there's very few picture of him. Is that yeah. what I'm saying? I know. It's like, I, he's like, where's Walt? I want to. I want to. It's like the Schnuffle I guess. I want to see who he yeah. is. <laughs> uh, the, the the interesting thing, as I say, in February when I went to Italy, I, I it was it, we. Uh, my best friend came and picked me up and took me to all this meeting. We had the best time. I met with Parmigiano Reggiano companies. I met with the uh, book editors. And, and by the time of the week, my friend could have done my pitch because he heard it so many times. We had the best time. But everyone, I didn't, I knew that the last meeting I had was with this uh, person, Mauro. His name is Mauro Viveri. And I didn't know who he was. He was mysterious. And nobody in Parma, so I thought he wasn't well known. But everybody I talked to, I'm going to meet Mauro. Everybody told me, you're going to meet the most extraordinary person of your life. He's a maverick. He does things outside of politics, outside of sponsorship. Is a true vision. By the time I met him, I thought it didn't exist because <laughs> there was so much, there was so much, you know, the expectation. And then I fell in love. He, he loved me immediately and I loved him. And I know he's a, a, a people person. So am I. We share the same birthday. He's a little older than me. He has these beautiful blue eyes. He speaks very softly. You can tell that he has a real passion. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say, but things come out of his pocket. He, he spends money to make this thing happen. Yeah, he's, it's, he's, it's he's, big, um, and it's with integrity, though. It's the the reason is to is is like in full alignment for for good. Is like not like you said. Not I, think, I think I think his problem is integrity in in the sense that I want that I want to show them to the world. I, I really is a, my new my new passion because I really fell in love with that, and I think it's protective. You know what I mean when you're talking yeah. about integrity. I yeah. think. He doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, he's tempted, he's tempted to tell the world, look what we're doing, it can be done. And at the same time, I think that's his baby. You know what yeah. I mean? He's very protective. And so I'm trying to wedge myself in between those two things and say, come on, let's, let's just start with an event in Los Angeles. We get some celebrities in the world of food and biodiversity, and we show what you do and we let people taste your food. And But also the way you tackle this thing. I mean, uh, farmers' children was were fleeing. Nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to be a farmer. You break your back for pennies, right? You work yeah, in the field tough. all day. Now these guys say, "No, you making money." Also, it's fun. This 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 uh, this festival was just incredibly fun. There were so many people. I mean, it, it, it just so is biodiversity. When we say biodiversity, I mean it's it's such a broad statement. Yeah, a word. I mean, it, it's it's basically. I don't know. Do you have a, a an easy definition for it? I would say, I would say, I would tell people to make it understand that we have the tendency of limiting the crops. 
for the word that I hate the most these days, convenience, again, right? <laughs> like there's thousands of kinds of apples, yet we grow three kinds, right? And so he's, he's favoring a diversity in terms of crops and, and um, livestock, but mostly favoring the one that they're native, the one that there was a reason why they... Yeah, why they... Gr- why they grew there, the native, that's, that's where, right. Yeah, the, that's the, right. That's the, that's right. The, why the soil, the, the weather, you know, all this stuff, there, there was a reason why they were there. And, and maybe they were forgotten because they didn't fit in the sort of a modern way of, of uh, cultivating um, uh, things, you know? And, and so, I mean, he, he makes, I, I mean, I, I know sometimes talking about meat and stuff is tough, especially in Los Angeles, but he makes money um, with ham. Uh, this is Parma and cold cuts is like a religion there. Yeah. And he has, um, he lets his pig go free in the woods. He dedicates the pigs large, vast part of woods. So the pigs live freely, you know, eat everything they can find as opposed to have pigs just raised into uh, small spaces inside the barn and so forth, you know? Yeah. And uh, if, if a pig gets sick, and they have to use antibiotics, then he won't, he won't use that pig anymore because he doesn't believe in antibiotics at all. Oh, but that's interesting because, um, yeah, because it gets passed on and, and you ingest it yeah. and then, the, and then it right. has babies. That's right. Yeah. So I'm, in, my, in my Pixar version of that adventure, I can see all the pigs figuring out that if they're sick, and get antibiotics, they don't get slaughtered, so they all pretend to be sick. Uh, and go to the <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny, right? <laughs> That's really funny. So do you think that what you experienced at Rural.it with the mindset that we have in the States, do you think that would be able to translate culturally to here, to be able to, for people to understand? Because I think it, I think personally that it is the, it is the right time. I think everybody's kind of awareness and desire, like we said, and that that is all coming together and, and looking at ingredients, like you said, and, and the transparency of traceability and where where your food comes from, the ingredients. So how you think you would be able to translate here with the experiences and the cultural differences you have explored over there? Let me say something, I, and I don't want to be offensive. I mean, there's a reason why I live in the United States. I love America and particularly I love Southern California, Los Angeles. I'm a big fan of uh, people over here, the place, the weather. Um, and to everybody in Italy, they ask me, what are you doing there? I say, I think we live in paradise in Southern California. Okay, so I'm prefacing that. But when it comes to food, <laughs> you know, you can't get to the level of sophistication that Italians have. Okay. And, and this last trip I took was another example. First, they have an ease. You go everywhere. I went to visit a friend of mine in a small village. We wake up in the morning. We go around the corner to the local bakery. And I walk in and everywhere, focaccia, bread with olives, the most amazing breads that yeah. not even rich people can buy here. And this is a small place, you know, in, 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 in fact, yeah. I put an Instagram uh, posting because I asked for some focaccia with mortadella. Oh, yeah, inside, the mortadella for breakfast. My favorite <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> for breakfast. It used to be my favorite breakfast in Italy. And here I am in the middle of nowhere, tasting a combination of flavors so delicious. And so there's an ease that they don't know how spoiled they are. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And they can be critical. And also there's an understanding of food and an appreciation of food that is so finely tuned that I don't think it's going to be a message that's going to come across as easy to America. But said that, the bigger picture the idea, for example, that I don't know if you've seen Zoe de Chanel video about bread. She made, she's, she's in, um, I talked to them. She has a company called The Farm Project and she made a video. She has children. She, had, she made a video and she started the video by saying, this is a, a, a white slice bread. If we show this bread to a person 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they will not even recognize it as bread. This is as far as we went from bread. And so she showed the farmer that, that still farm the grains like they used to do and, and mill it. Then she goes into the kitchen with my friend Clemence from the Gourmandis Culinary School where I work in, some, in the Santa Monica. Oh, yeah. And they make bread. And they make bread. And the beautiful thing about the video, I always thought at the end, they slaughtered this freshly made bread with butter and jam. 
and they eat it. So it's not even about diet. It's not even about, it's just about wholesome food, real food, food made the real way, you know? So I think that message, that message can come across from um, from an organization like Rural, that we have to go back to a concept of food that is different. I mean, now we have to take medicine because the food that we eat poison us. I know, okay? it's, I it's so crazy. But, but, but food is medicine, <laughs> or it's supposed to be medicine. Yeah. If you eat the right food, it's medicine for your body. You don't need to be cured from that. Yep. The fact that we went, we, we, we completely flipped the equation and food and we need medicine to cure us from bad food that we produce is absurd, absurd. Yeah. And so, and so that's, that's the message that rural has as a core, which is go back to food that was real food. It's not convenient. We may have to eat less. We may have to eat less meat every week. We may not have everything we want at all time. But remember when things were not available at all season, at all time? Remember when you had to wait summer for the cherries? Nobody died, but the cherries were delicious. Now we have cherries throughout the year yeah. and they taste like nothing. And they taste like nothing. So for, for this idea of convenience, we miss so much and we lose so much and we poison ourselves. And so that core message I think it's about time that America wake up and smell the bacon because mm -hmm. there's so little regulation when it comes to food in America that is appalling. I know. And that brings us back to what we started off in the beginning is just raising our awareness and the quote IQ of, yeah. of, of all of us here and around the world too. Ah, Chef Gino, do you have a recipe to share with us? I always like to uh, close out our our awesome episode here with a recipe. Well, I'm going to just, it's the simplest recipe, but it's the one I do the most. And especially recently, I, I do it in inner city schools or I do it for team building events, you know, for Google people or, or Snapchat people. And it's the fresh pasta that my mom would used to make uh, on Sundays. Um, pasta all'uovo or pasta sfoglia, it's called. And it's pretty much egg noodle. And it's the combination of just two simple ingredients, flour and eggs, that makes one of the most delicious and, and adaptable food you know, that everybody loves. That is great. I mean, I, I, I bring flour and eggs down to an inner city schools. I get these kids to, 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 to mash it together, uh, knead it, and they roll it and they eat the pasta they make. They go home and say, I'm a chef. I'm a chef because you make <laughs> pasta, right? So it's a combination of being very easy once you learn how to do it. And very satisfying because you think, well, if I can make pasta, I can make everything. So the proportion, though, is where things get a little sketchy. So I'm going to give you my recipe as per my book, you know, because in Italy, traditionally speaking, is 100 grams of flour and one egg. And then we could talk about the flowers and so forth. But I, I'm going to, as you, as you know, I like to simplify things and we're going to use all purpose in America. So one uh, 100 grams and one egg, it's pretty much a three-quarter cup and an egg. So to simplify the equation now, I say uh, one cup of flour, one egg, and one yolk. The fact that we add one yolk makes the um, dough a little more yellow because in Italy, the yolk of eggs are almost is almost orange. So when you make pasta, pasta is really of a dark yellow. In America, it tends to be a little lighter. It's, it's, it's all, it all has to do with what they feed chicken here and there. Yeah. So one cup of flour, one egg, one yolk. So two cup of flour, two eggs, two yolks. A hundred cup of flour, a <laughs> hundred eggs, a hundred yolks. A million cup of flour, <laughs> a million eggs, a million yolks. So it's, I, I like to say that recipe because it's easy to remember and you can't do wrong. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Chef Gino, uh, it's at chefgino.club and your Instagram handle and uh, it's going to, everything's on your website, but your, um, your Insta is Gino the chef. Gino the chef. On Instagram. Thank you so much. You're amazing. And I, I'm excited to, uh, to um, somehow maybe collaborate with you on any events that you have coming here. I love what you're doing. Debbie, this has been a pleasure and uh, I'll let you know every time I got something juicy coming up, I will let you know. Ah, thank you, Chef. Okay. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, 
please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones, please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is just forkingaround.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.